Gene editing and CRISPR are probably two of the most exciting advances that's happened in the life sciences in the past few years. I'm looking forward to a fascinating discussion on the ethical implications of that with our panel today. Um, just so you know, there will be time for questions towards the end of this session. But to begin with, um, I'd like to have our panelists introduce yourselves and speak a little to what, how it is that your companies are involved in CRISPR and gene editing. Rachel? Sure. Uh, my name is Rachel Harwitz, and I'm the CEO of Caribou Bio, and we are a CRISPR gene editing company. Um, we've been around for about seven years, and historically, through partnership, have enabled other companies to use gene editing in everything from drug discovery to plant and livestock breeding. And today, we're developing gene-edited cell therapies to treat cancer and other diseases. Thank you for the invitation. I'm Paul Dabrowski, CEO of Synthigo. We essentially are providing access to the best ways of doing genome engineering. So we uh, provide the tools to scientists. We fundamentally believe that the future of medicine, the unit of therapeutic modality, will be a cell. And so we're building out the technologies and tools to enable a hockey stick curve in terms of developing those types of therapies. Thank you uh, for the invitation, Sai, and thank you, Fortune. Uh, I'm Udit Batra. I'm the CEO of Millipore Sigma. We are one of the larger, largest provider of tools and reagents to do experiments in laboratories. We have roughly 1.6 million customers who use our products. Uh, and we are one of the largest producers of biopharmaceutical equipment. So when you need to scale up CRISPR-Cas9 kits and, 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 uh, and send them to human beings, you use our equipment to do so. So uh, very happy to be here. To begin with, we all know this story about this Chinese scientist who claimed that he's created gene-edited babies in, Ch in China that ostensibly will make them immune to certain diseases. What was your reaction when you heard that story, and did that change your mindset or your approach to your business? So I happened to be in Hong Kong at that meeting. Um, I learned of the news when my plane touched down, so that was not exactly what I expected to be reading as we taxied to the gate. Personally, I, I was devastated. Um, you know, I, I believe fundamentally in the power and the potential of this technology, but I also fundamentally believe drug development needs to be about assessing safety and ultimately efficacy. And I don't feel that this was an appropriate step uh, at this point in time. Um, I would say his actions, though, didn't change how we function as an organization. Um, we already spend a lot of time thinking about the, the ethical implications and how, how we want to operate as an organization. And so for years, we've had the corporate policy of, of no embryo editing full stop. Um, and we apply that not only to ourselves, but to companies with whom we do deals. So if you buy a reagent, for example, from a company who has a license from us, that obnoxious little piece of paper that you usually throw away that's in the reagent box, that's a limited use label license. And one of the terms of our license is that you cannot use these materials for embryo editing. Uh, at Synthigo, we have a similar position to what Caribou um, does. We do have an internal screening process, and immediate reaction was, oh, this, this, might, be, this might be a game changer for the industry. Um, and of course, we checked our customer list. It was not on it. Um, but there's likely a, this is the beginning of a call to action in terms of industry uh, coordinating and being transparent. I think in general, there isn't much of a problem if we have a conversation and researchers are bought in. It's when someone kind of peels off on their own and decides, hey, I'm, I've got a, something to prove. That's when the issue comes in. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a topic that really needs to be carefully considered uh, and in a unified way uh, represented throughout the industry. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think not much to add in terms of internal policies, but I, I would put this into context. I think we are living in a time, and it's an exciting time, right? It's an exciting time when so many technologies are moving from the clinic, to, uh, from, from, the, from the labs to the clinic, and they're moving so fast that we are rather caught unprepared in many different areas. And one of them is, of course, getting these medicines to so many patients, right? We are quite facile in producing thousands, millions of doses for, for patients with uh, patients who need proteins, monoclonal antibodies, 
but we haven't spent any time or limited time in scaling up and producing and, and creating technologies that will allow access for these incredible technologies to get to many, many different patients. That's one of the problems where we've been caught with our pants down. Biology has moved much faster than physics and engineering has, and we are working on this problem. And another area is, is bioethics, right? So we had set up a, um, uh, in our company, a bioethics advisory panel, which includes leading bioethicists uh, from all over the globe, uh, leading uh, legal experts, regulatory experts, and they set up a set of guiding principles outside in, and then we turn them into policies, and the policies are not incredibly different than what you just mentioned. No germline editing, limited use, license, uh, active monitoring of 1.6 million or so patients if they intend to use something differently. But I would think for us as a community, it's time to now set these principles that are commonly understood across the board. And then if somebody deviates from them, we at least know they deviated, right? So unless you have a commonly set of uh, a commonly understood set of principles, you don't know if somebody's deviated from them. Beyond your self-imposed set of ethical guidelines, is there something in the way of official guidance you're beginning to see from the government or anything like that? And uh, if so, where do you think the progress is on that front, on really setting these rules in stone? Well, I mean, therapeutic regulation happens on a national level, not an international level, right? So there, there are pre-existing guidelines in most countries around the world that to some extent already accommodate this. Um, I think in many there are examples of sort of accidental holes. So in some countries, for example, the way regulation is written, it's very clear that you're not to use gene editing to modify embryos. But what's missing is the same language to say that you should not use gene editing to modify sperm or egg cells which would get you to the same place. And it's just a happenstance of the language that was used many years before these technologies came online. And so I think a lot of countries are, are quickly looking at, at their frameworks, but these are not changes that happen quickly. And so I, I think it's a dialogue that will happen for years. What I would personally love to see is some sort of international consortium that's able to wrestle with this at a level of principles, of course, which can only be applied or acted upon at an individual national level. That's happening in a few different ways. There are a few different conversations going on right now. I think time will tell exactly how that pulls together. I think similarly, um, Germany, for instance, has a very stringent um, anti-germline modification uh, legislation, and our company is headquartered, our, our parent company is headquartered in Germany. So we definitely follow those rules. Um, but it is not uniform. There is no question about it. And it is not uniformly understood. There's not a common understanding of what the technology can do. There's not a common understanding of how you can make it ubiqu ubiquitously available. And all of those discussions need to take place with full transparency and a lot of collaboration across therapeutic uh, providers. I mean, we are a tools provider, so we're not holders of license of the final medicine. Um, but it has to be across the whole community of regulators, of legal experts, of medicine uh, providers, as well as tool makers. I think uh, Udid has brought up an interesting point a couple of times, who has access to, to these technologies. And I think there's a question on the research side, which is kind of the, the situation with the, the uh, alleged edited babies. But then there's also a longer term, who has access to the medicines. And I think actually that, that's going to become the big ethical question that we aren't talking about as a society yet. Because when you can cure disease, um, and it's a million dollar drug, that's a, there's some tough questions in that. So one of the, one of the things that we, we deeply consider is how do you make this ubiquitously accessible, not just on the research side, but ultimately on the therapeutic side. And I think that's, that's a very important conversation topic. The, if you also think about it, whatever we decide as a society in terms of acceptable uses, in some ways it becomes a little bit easier if it's understandable that everybody's gonna have access to it in a similar way. And so that's, that's kind of the other angle. The top down is how do you use it, the bottom up is who has access. And I think it's a very important point on access, right? On the cost side. Um, as we were talking earlier, the engineering has not progressed at the same pace, right? So you, you really haven't started with a clean sheet of paper and we were talking backstage. We're using equipment that we use to produce a lot of proteins to produce small viral vectors. And there are significant issues, as I'm sure you, got, you were aware, Rachel, um, in producing viral vectors for cell and gene therapy at scale. 
right? So the first thing we're doing is we're taking this primitive, and I think this morning somebody said Flintstone equipment to address Star Wars problems. We're using Flintstone equipment and we're modifying it to solve these problems for now because patients are waiting and this is a highly conservative industry once something gets launched. And then in the mid to long term, in the five to 10 year period, we're developing new technology that is going to change how we get these incredible therapies uh, to, to patients all around the globe at a, at a, at a meaningful and an affordable cost. What, what Aditya, uh, Udit just mentioned, um, basically for the entrepreneurs in the room, there's opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely something we're, we're focused on at Syntego, but I think there's a lot of room for innovation in this area. Well, and Paul, I'm, I'm glad, glad you brought up this point of patient access and, and the breadth of these therapies and their potential. Um, and I think gene editing is a critical component to actually turning this into a process that is cost effective and deliverable at scale, right? If you look, for example, at the, the first ever approved cell therapies here in the United States, CAR T therapies for treating certain kinds of cancer, um, they're miraculous, but they're also incredibly challenging therapies. They're patient specific. You're taking a cancer patient's own immune cells, manufacturing a custom product, <clears throat> excuse me, just for them and then re-delivering it back to them. It's incredibly complicated and challenging to think about how you scale that. Well, how do you turn that into something that could be an off-the-shelf product? Gene editing is the answer, and I think that'll be true across the precision medicine space. But I think you have to optimize that CAR T cell supply chain. So Absolutely. as an engineer, when I first Absolutely. looked at that supply chain of taking a patient cells, flying it across the country, modifying it, flying it back, and you hope that these terminal patients are still around. Right. Um, uh, it's, it's a nightmare, right? I mean, why would you not have a bedside solution? But we're far away from it, yeah. right? We have to optimize the existing supply chain uh, in order to solve these problems. We've been talking a lot about the clinical and healthcare implications of, of CRISPR and of gene editing, but that's not the only way that these technologies can be used. There's a lot of implications for things like agriculture, and I imagine those come with their own set of ethical concerns and ethical questions. What do you think are some of the most important questions to ask along those lines, having something that's edited like this enter our food supply chain, potentially? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, Caribou has the pleasure to have licensees who are, are doing exactly this work in plants uh, and in livestock. And there's a very clear regulatory infrastructure in place, certainly here in the United States and, and other places, to really assess the, the safety and ultimately the eff efficacy of these types of modifications. So I don't really have concerns from, a, from an infrastructure or bureaucracy perspective, but I do find it fascinating that our communities approach this exact same scientific technology with completely different mindsets depending on where they're going to be used. If it's a new therapy that could potentially treat and cure grandma's disease, we approach it with great hope and enthusiasm. If instead it's to make uh, another variant of corn, for example, a lot of people who had been really excited about that therapy have significant concerns about genetically modified foods. I'll say I don't. Um, everyone in this room has eaten genetically modified foods. We're fine. Um, but I, I do think it's really important to recognize that our society is not in the same place on the technology. It's how it's used, it's where it's used, and how they get access to transparent information about how it's used. The, the philosophy of, um, I guess, modifying food is an interesting one. Even if you're not a GMO supporter, arguably you should still be a supporter of CRISPR or other nucleases and next generation technologies because it simply allows you to edit with more precision. And arguably, depending on how it's used, you, you could look at the next generation of these types of food modifications as like a, um, the Star Wars version of doing plant breeding, where you're taking a trait from one plant and inserting it to another. So there are ways of using it, uh, the technologies, um, in a way that's, I think, most everyone could find accept, uh, acceptable. And I mean, maybe to add a slightly orthogonal point, I mean, fear is not the solution. Right? I mean, technology is here. It's terrific technology. It's going to help a lot of patients. And we talked a bit about certain intractable diseases and interesting approaches this morning. This is one of them. Let's not get in the way, but let's take some time to develop technologies to make sure it can get to many more patients and develop a commonly understood ethical framework. I think that's what you're hearing us say. And, there, and that's, I think, a commonly understood belief. And there are communities getting together to start to do this. Great. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to the audience to see if, uh, if anybody has any questions.
I'm Danielle from the University of Southern California. So just going back to the embryonic gene editing, I was wondering, so obviously it would be great to edit out detrimental diseases of the human population, but what would be the ethical concern considering eugenics and the science going forward? I mean, I think for me personally, one of the immediate concerns or questions is really in the weeds of the technology itself. So today, it's, it's, it's a biological process, which means it's imperfect. You want to make a change at a specific location, but there are chances that you make changes elsewhere in the genome. Now, any application that you consider using it for, you have to think about the cost benefit or the, the risk benefit analysis of utilizing that and whether you're comfortable with those potential off-target consequences. I think when you're looking at a terminal illness, uh, likely in, you know, in cells that will not be passed on to the next generation, you're much more likely to accommodate that risk. Whereas I think today we simply do not know enough, we do not understand enough to even begin to think about the potential consequences of modifying other sites within the genome, modifying different cells differently in an early stage embryo, and what impact that could have on the developing human being. I, I really like what you've just said. Uh, it, it, we need a bit of humility with the technology, right? And it's, it's new technology that is going into new domains. We need to be thoughtful about the benefit to risk ratio and do it, do, and make decisions based on data and not just based on, on heuristics and fear. I would, I would also proclaim the technology is not quite there yet. And I would actually set a bar for where the technology could get to to simplify some of these questions. I like the uh, ethical question distilled kind of to a concrete situation or, 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 or answer. And in my mind, there should always be someone who can consent. Meaning, if you did want to modify an embryo, it would make a lot more sense to modify the human as a whole, including the germline, and then have them pass on those traits. Because then you have someone consenting, willing to take the risk themselves. I'm not saying that's necessarily the best situation, but just thinking through practically, there are answers that can simplify these things, just like access simplifies things. Potentially that kind, of, um, that kind of approach can simplify things. But that requires a whole different level of technology than what we have. And so then that comes back to us on stage or the people who are in the industry. Let's try and move the technology as quickly as possible in order to enable the ethical uses of it. Great. We have another question over here. Jody Halpern, UC Berkeley Professor of Bioethics and Tech Ethics. Um, I, I have to say, at first I thought, oh, there's no ethicists on the panel. And then I thought, oh, well, that's great because my whole thing is that we need the scientists and the technology developers to internalize the reflective issues, which you've all done beautifully. But I still am enough of a, of a, of a uh, you know, didactic teacher to want to say that what just happened is all, you actually each spoke a completely different ethical system. So Rachel went to um, the, the questions about eugenics and justice, and which all of you care about. Rachel went to a risk benefit, which is a utilitarian model. Um, the gentleman in the center brought up social justice and human rights, and you kind of did both a little bit, I think. So um, what happens when you really think about ethical reasoning at a high level, at a doctoral and advanced level, is these models actually contradict each other in a lot of settings. That's why I like your thing about use cases and being very, we've sort of shown that the way to really resolve these things has to be very concrete and problem specific. And then we need to really be able to blend expert thinking in science, expert thinking in technology, but really to appreciate that ethics is not this low level, some, you know, obviously I have a shtick here, but it really is its own discipline and it needs to be really understood by scientists and engineers. A lot of what we're doing is trying to change science and engineering education. But um, one of the things that happened today that I know you all are aware of, we went right to the germline, but really most of the progress is in somatic cell. I know you're all involved in that. But even with any new technology, the, the issues of human rights and patients, which has to do with informed consent, the issues of distributive justice and cost, and the issues of efficacy and safety, every person in this room cares about, because it's related to all the talks yesterday, too. And what I'm seeing is people not seeing the commonalities about data and everything else and gene editing issues that are going to really affect populations, which are costs, real individual informed consent, but 
that doesn't solve the population issues of justice. Do you guys have any comments on that? It's a terrific point, and we hear something similar from our bioethics and uh, bioethics advisory panel. Um, I think the apparent paradox between individual need and social justice is quite an important one, right? And it can only be solved specifically. You cannot make general principles that apply to everyone in such a complex topic. And technology plays a role. And I mean, we try to oversimplify these topics, and we just haven't we haven't, we don't have enough use cases that we have specifically targeted, targeted and solved these problems with these principles that you, some of which you've mentioned. So really, totally agree with what you said. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll give maybe a specific use case that I, I know you've, you've heard before in other contexts. Um, deafness. I think some people in the scientific or medical community look at that as a disease that should be cured and eradicated from the population. Well, it turns out many people in the deaf community don't agree. And so the question of whether you should or should not use gene editing to manipulate the genes that could or could not cause deafness is actually a much more complicated question than it initially appears and leads to exactly all, all the questions that you raise. Um, something I hope we will see that's not quite happening yet is a broader mixture of voices. Some of the international meetings that have been brought together have really excluded industry so far. Some of the things that industry is doing has excluded academia. I think we need to find a, a better way to get more voices together. Great. Any closing thoughts, Paul? Um, I, I agree that there's a, there's a different level of discourse that needs to happen. And uh, perhaps the ethics discourse here uh, is framed by kind of the practical cases of what we see in industry versus, say, uh, being able to step back and really understand the philosophy behind it. So I appreciate your, your comments and uh, thank you. Thank you again for the panel. Great. All right. I want to thank all our panelists. Thank you so much for coming and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.